A number of years ago, I was at a church in Calgary that, um, that did something like this every Sunday. And uh, as awkward as it seemed and as weird as it was to take a break in the middle of the service, their pastor kept saying over and over and over that it was brilliant for the sake of community in their church. And uh, so as we look at Nehemiah over the next eight weeks, one of the things that we're going to keep coming back to is the together part of this. And so I want to try this just for a few weeks, just to see what it does and, and how it works. We may not do it anymore after that. Uh, it, we may decide it's great. I don't know yet. But I want to try this because, uh, and, and some other things over the next few weeks, as we look at Nehemiah, to really begin to lean into the pull together part. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I've been doing a lot of reading lately about the, the condition of the church across Canada. And uh, it's interesting to see in today's world what is important versus what isn't important. Not just in people's lives, in Christians' lives, but as a church as we come together. Uh, as, as, as this generation in today's world looks at relationships differently, looks at community differently, looks at fellowship completely differently than 20 years ago. Look, I've been reading about why churches are effective in reaching people and why some churches are not effective. I've been reading about trends and passions and generations, what is really working and what isn't working and effective and not effective. And, and, and even little things like uh, the connecting part of church. And... and we all are, are very aware that there's a number of people who come to church every Sunday and their hope is that they can remain invisible. And, and as I read, I'm starting to realize all across North America, those people, for the most part, are stopping attending on Sunday mornings. And the phrase that, that stuck in my mind this week as I read was, the new attendance is engagement. That churches across the board are, are stopping the counting heads on Sunday morning and saying, this is our church. But they're counting people that are actually engaged in the ministry of the church and studying the word and the community, and they're counting that. That's a huge shift. It's a huge shift in church and how we do church and how we look at it. So I, as I examine this and think, how do we relate to that? Or how do we not relate to these things? Why are churches across Canada and the United States shrinking and disappearing? How do we not fall into that? What will keep us from that? What will be our priorities going forward? As I respond to this, I've landed on an eight-week series in the book of Nehemiah. And if you have a Bible, you can flip there. We won't get there for a few minutes yet. But each week in this series, we're going to attempt to be more intentional on the relational aspects of accomplishing our vision. We have a purpose as a church. We have a reason we exist. And notice I didn't say we're going to focus on the community relationship fellowship aspects of our church. I said, we're going to focus and be intentional on the relational community fellowship ways we accomplish our mission. And I'm afraid that so much of what we do as a church is not on mission. It's on stuff we like and we want. And we need to figure this out. So as we dig into Nehemiah, we will see, and I think the bottom line to our study is this. God gives them vision and direction. Will they band together to see that come to life? God gives them the vision and direction. Will they band together to make it happen? In the face of re fractured relationships, in opposition, in difficulty, in sin, in successes, in failures, in good leaders and in bad leaders, in people, people are people. Years and years they had to straighten this out. To accomplish God's vision for them, 
They needed to trust God. They needed to trust and follow leadership. They needed to put aside their differences in order to pull together, and it takes everybody. These are things we're going to see over the next eight weeks. So will you enter into this with me? Over the next eight weeks, I'm asking you to approach this with openness, with willingness, and with expectation to see what God will do. At the beginning of Nehemiah, the entire community of Israel was fractured. They were separated. They were broken apart. They were away from home. Seventy years, they were going through the motions far from God's dream for them. When it, made, when it came time for them to make it right and put the pieces back together, only a fraction of the people actually made the effort. Only some engaged. And it burned Nehemiah's heart. Not for his own sake. Nehemiah wasn't longing to put it back together for the old days. Nehemiah was longing for God's sake, for God's honor, and for God's kingdom and God's people. And I think as we look at Nehemiah, we're going to see that there's lots of similarities between that day 2,500 years ago and, and today, individually and as a church. The community, together, hand in hand, the collective cooperation, the collaboration, the accomplishing God's vision is what this book is all about. In Nehemiah, we'll see that everyone with different pos priorities, different skills, different interests, they banded together for the sake of the mission of God. Will you join me on this eight-week journey? Let's pray. Our Father, as we dig into this, I ask that you would open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts, that we would honestly see what you have. There are things in here that will disturb us and change us and direct us. God, Above all, will you speak clearly and will we be open to hear your voice? So speak to us today. May it be your breath in my lungs, your thoughts in my head, and your words come out my mouth as we dig into your word this morning. We want to see you and hear from you. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. When you read the book of Nehemiah, you can't do that without reading the book of Ezra. They go together hand in hand. There's, in a sense, they're one right after the other chronologically, but there's so many details in one that if you don't know, they will mess you up reading the other one. But interestingly, the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Zechariah and Haggai and Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah all happen at the same time. And so to try to pack all of the content of all of those books and all of these different things and perspectives gives us the actual picture of what's going on. Let's look at all of these books and try to pull that story together today. I'll bet that very few of us know this whole story. Maybe not at all. So let's dig into history. And incidentally, on Wednesday nights in our uh, group 180, we're taking uh, a bunch of weeks here to look through the Old Testament. And we're doing some of these same kind of things that are going to overlap. And so if you're here with us and you're in grade uh, 7 or 8, maybe grade 9, uh, I'm restarting the Skittles thing again today. So if you take notes, show them to me later afterwards, I will uh, reward you if your notes are worthy. How about that? Let's up the ante a little bit. Let's get some good notes. All right. Nathan read for us before the, from the beginning of Nehemiah. I want to just look quickly at the first couple of verses, and then I'm going to go into the background story here. They were in the, in the city of Susa, in the citadel, and one of his brothers came to him. This is verse 2. 
and with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued in fasting and praying before the God of heaven. To start understanding this story and picking it up, we need to start in the book of Jeremiah. And I won't ask you to flip all over the place with me as I go around here, but Jeremiah, the prophet, for the 20 years leading up, had had been proclaiming, come on guys, God's dream for you is so much more. We're off. Come on, let's get it straight. He called for a correction line. And the first 21 chapters of Jeremiah, he's on this over and over and over and over. They were up and down and up and down for generations. And for 20 years, Jeremiah was calling them to repentance, to renewal, to revival, but for a correction line. And then in chapter 21 in Jeremiah, God gives him a very clear prophetic word. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is making war against us. Let's pray, see if God will deal with us. And as they prayed, obviously, like you and I, If we are being oppressed and this is coming down on us, what do we pray? God, protect us. God, deliver us. God, we are your people. Get rid of Nebuchadnezzar. Get rid of Babylon. Let us live and be free and and thrive. God says, I will bring them together into the midst of the city. I myself will fight against you. My outstretched hand and long arm in anger and fury and great wealth. I will strike down the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. And you will live as a prize of war. Jeremiah comes to them and says, come on. God is at the doorstep ready to correct us. Nebuchadnezzar himself is going to come and displace us and take us away. In the next chapter, in in chapter 22, in chapter 23, and he gets to chapter 25. He's still going on in this. And he actually says, God will deport you from your place and put you in exile for 70 years. They still don't listen. They still pray, God, deliver us. God, get rid of the enemy. God, protect us. Instead of saying, God, examine us. And God was calling judgment on these people. In the the middle of all of this, false prophets were coming and standing against Jeremiah. And they were declaring the word of the Lord as God will protect us. Step aside, Jeremiah, you're wrong. Well, who's hearing God then? And this went on for years. And finally, in chapter 27 of Jeremiah, this happens. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, comes and invades Jerusalem, destroys the city conquers it. And, and I said a couple of weeks ago as we were talking about something different, Babylon built their empire. They were a powerhouse for almost a thousand years. And right before this, Assyria had conquered them and Assyria ruled for about 200 years. But now Assyria had crumbled and Babylon was back on top. They were building their empire and their strength by taking over cities, corralling the people, displacing them, moving them to their own cities. They didn't wipe out Jerusalem and kill all the people. They wiped out the city and moved all the people into Babylon and said, go ahead, thrive, live, do your jobs, work. And they built their economy. They built their power on the backs of these people. Like Jeremiah had said, you'll be displaced. You'll live as a prize of war. And so the first wave of people were deported to Babylon. Daniel was one of those people. Another wave was deported about 10 years later. 
And then a third wave about 10 years later. And Jerusalem was now empty, flattened, completely destroyed. The walls broken, the temple destroyed, uh, burned by fire. And the prophet Jeremiah was one of these people that was with them. While they were there, Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah were key leaders. And the book of Lamentations, if you've been around, you've heard me talk about that before. It's a book of whining. This is where it fits. These people in Babylon, in exile from their country, everything's done and gone. And he's lamenting over that. And that's how these kind of things all, are all fitting together. We know lots of stories from this time period in Babylon. 70 years there. It's all the stories with Daniel. And Daniel and the others that rose up into leadership. And they were living actually under the care of the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And he gave them the, the best of everything and the best foods and education. And these people would not eat the fatty foods. You know those stories? And God had blessed them. For taking a stand for him. We know the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and the fiery furnace. All of that is in this context. The 70 years of exile came and went. And it was intended by God as a serious correction line for his people. After 70 years, Persia under King Cyrus invaded and took over and conquered Babylon. And men like Daniel were really embraced by the Persian king. They were great leaders, loved by the Persian kings. So King Cyrus made some really interesting moves. So now Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, and all of that has been defeated. Persia has taken over. And if we turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah... If I can find it here. Isaiah chapter 44, 45. In chapter 44, verse 28, Isaiah, well before this, well before 300 years, 400 years before this, Isaiah says, Cyrus, God will use Cyrus, or sorry, yeah, Cyrus, as my shepherd. He will fulfill all of my purposes. He will say to Jerusalem, you will be rebuilt. He will say of the temple, your foundation will be laid. 300 years or 400 years before this, God says through Isaiah, Cyrus will come and he will rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. This is a foreign pagan king that's going to do God's work. In chapter 25, I have stirred him up in righteousness, God says. And I will make all his ways level. And he will build my city and set my exiles free. Not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Isn't that interesting? You, you wonder if these people in exile, I wonder if they put two and two together. I wonder if when Cyrus became king of Persia and took over, I wonder if they got it. And they celebrated because Isaiah, they would have known this. But I wonder if they put it all together. And so Cyrus sends Zerubbabel and the high priest, and they lead the people. This is according to the book of Ezra, in Ezra chapter 2. A first wave of 42,360 people get sent by Cyrus to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And in the book of Ezra, in chapter 1, um, let me read that quickly, in in Ezra chapter 1 says, In the first year of Cyrus the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout his whole kingdom, and put it in writing, that thus says the Cyrus the king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all of his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Isn't that crazy that God would use the foreign pagan ungodly king? In verse 7, Cyrus the king also brought out all of the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away. 
not only did this king decree people, go home and rebuild your temple. Take all of the stuff that Nebuchadnezzar looted from your temple and take it back. Build the altar. Sacrifice to your God. This is the decree of the Persian king. Wow. Well, in seven months, the altar had been rebuilt and sacrifices were offered for the first time in 70 years. They started the foundation, the foundation of the temple. Well, eventually Cyrus was no longer king. A couple of other short-term kings messed things up. And the enemies of Israel sent letters to the new kings of Persia and eventually ended up in halting all of the building. So after all of this, finally heading in the right direction, why this opposition? There's always opposition. Ten or twelve years later, Darius becomes king in Persia. Darius loves Daniel. It's talked about in the book of Daniel. And he loves Daniel and brings Daniel into a place of high standing. And you know the story. The other leaders plot against Daniel. And they convince Darius to create an edict where you can't pray to anyone else other than, than Darius. And so Daniel gets caught praying to God and gets thrown in the lion's den. And this whole time, Darius, who loves Daniel... Now look at the story. It's so brilliant. Darius' response after Daniel is safe from the lion's den. So here's another king that comes that is soft-hearted because of God's work towards these people. And he actually decrees that the temple work must restart. And five years later, the temple is completed. And it's re rebuilt completely. This is the same temple that it would have been in Jerusalem in the day of Jesus. It was destroyed again in 70 AD and has never been rebuilt. And Ezra chapter 7 talks about the celebrations and the sacrifices that happened when the temple was rebuilt. And the people of Jerusalem settled in. They had their lives back. They had their homes, their temple. They rebuilt their life. Good, right? Uh, fast forward 35 years. Xerxes is now king in Persia. And Xerxes builds his harem, and one of the people he brings into his harem in Susa is Esther. Two years later, Esther is queen, and Xerxes, through the leadership of ungodly men, and you, I'm sure you know these stories, almost completely terminates and eradicates the entire Jewish race of people. And Esther is the one that saves that. But nothing changes in Jerusalem. The same old, same old. And what we end up seeing is for the next 20 years, they settle into their lives and they're right back to where they were religiously before the exile. They've got all the trappings. They've got their temple. They've got their sacrifices. They've got all their religious life. And they're missing what God wanted. They so desperately fought to regain what they had rather than taking the correction line and actually doing what God wants. They're missing something. God in his grace works again and again through the pagan king. The next king was Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes actually commissions Ezra to return to Jerusalem with another wave of people and begin to teach the law. We see in Ezra chapter 7, it says, Ezra set his heart to study and to teach God's law. So they pull out the law of God and they start to read it again. And he calls the people forward. Again, coming from the Persian kings, decreeing. So they've decreed actually that the temple and the sacrifices get reinstated. And then they actually decree that you start learning your laws of God again. Interesting. And then just a few years later, that same king, Artaxerxes, who already has a soft heart towards Jerusalem and God's people, in that we're introduced to a character named Nehemiah. So all of that to say, let's go to the book of Nehemiah. And most of our time is gone, so I'll go quickly through this, but there's some really important things here. It's been a hundred years now since Cyrus decreed, go home and rebuild. And if you read those stories of Cyrus, he actually said, I'll pay for the whole thing too, even for your food. 
This is where we're going to pick up the story. The walls were built. The temple is finished. The law is reinstated. Life is back. And since the days of Jeremiah's warning 200 years earlier, 200 years to get back on track, to take the correction line, and even though the people thought they were good, hmm, they settled in. Ah, it's so good. They have their cities, their homes. They're back to the way it was which is the most dangerous phrase. All of a sudden, 10 years later, they were so far off base that the prophet Malachi comes. And we've visited Malachi in the, in the, within the last year. And Malachi says, you're offering blind animals. Shut the temple doors behind you because your worship is off. You've polluted the Lord's table. You've turned away from my side. They thought they were nailing it. They've wearied God with their words. They've robbed God from their tithe. On and on and on. They've settled back into their old religious ways. They went so desperately back to their comfort zone. They thought they were right. But it only took 10 years. They're worshiping without heart. Their giving and, and generosity is gone. Their self-centeredness in their walk with God. I've got it the way I like it. Leave it alone. Malachi says enough. And what happened? What happened at the end of Malachi? God says enough. And for 400 years, they did not hear the word of God. They did not hear the voice of God. God did not lead them. God did not send prophets or leaders. There was silence. And for 400 years, there is lost history of Israel. Until God sent John the Baptist, and then in the right time, Jesus. They got so comfort, comfortable, they got into their comfort zone, and boom, they went right back to where they were. This really messes with me. I don't know if that really stirs you up or not. That really stirs me up. How, how do we know what we're doing is right? How do we know that we're not just going through all the motions that we've built over the last hundred years of this is what church is? And we're not off just like they were. If our world is still here a thousand years from now and they look back on the 1900s and the 2000s, what are they going to say about us? Is it going to be the same story? Different characters, different situations? Will we actually learn from those who went before us? I don't think we are. Just this week, got a magazine, The New Faith Today. I don't know if you've seen it. The cover says, Church in Exile. Isn't that interesting? This is what I'm working on this week, and this lands on my desk. The church in exile. It's talking about Canada and the church being marginalized, disregarded, shut down, and excluded. And I think the church, obviously, don't, don't think the church is the organization Church is not the organization. Church isn't the building. Church is people. Church is us. It's you. And it's me. Why are we in Canada like people in exile? Maybe we've done a poor job of being the light and the hope in our world, in our culture. Maybe we're doing a great job at being segmented and separated and distant from our culture. And in Nehemiah's day, the same thing. We've got it the way we like it. And I'm following my comfort things rather than following Jesus. Next week, we'll look at Nehemiah's prayer that follows this. And if the, t the church today is in decline, if it's in scattered, if it's in exile, if it's marginalized... We'll see from Nehemiah that he doesn't start praying for the culture. He doesn't start praying for the prime minister or the president. He doesn't start praying that it will change. He starts praying that we will change. That we will listen to God. That we will be redeemed and restored and revived. He says, he prays, redeem and restore your servants. Boy, we need that same thing today. Redemption, restoration, revival, life and growth. Not to push us back into our own bunker. Where does this start? Let me use this as a whole uh, introduction to, to the, our study in Nehemiah. Nehemiah read this before, and, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province 
who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are destroyed by fire. And as soon as I heard these words, I wept down. I, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued in prayer and fasting before the God of heaven. I see Nehemiah's heart literally broken by the state of God's people. What breaks your heart about the condition of God's people? What breaks your heart about the state of God's people today? I've talked to several of you this week and asked that question. I've got four or five or six different answers. For some of you, your heart breaks like Nehemiah's because of the number of people who know the truth and are not living for God. For some of you, that wrecks you. And that breaks your heart. What will you do about that? Some of you said um, you're turned inside out by the need of our children to know God's ways. Does that twist your heart inside out? Or across North America, the church exists only to take care of itself. That bends some of you sideways. A couple of you said that it kills you that the number of Christian families that are in shambles. Does that wreck you? If these things, and there's lots others, wreck you, these things break God's heart too. What about the number of people who fill our churches that really are biblically illiterate? They don't know our ways around the Bible. And I know that some of you, uh, that wrecks you and have passion for years of teaching God's word so that people will know. Well, me too. People desperately need to know God's word. Some of you, like, like Jenna, your heart is driven that our children would know God, become like Jesus, change our world. And Tammy and Stephanie and Jamie and others, whose passion that people would really engage in worship. It's not about us, it's about him. What burns you about the condition of God's people today? I'm already way over time, let me, let me say this. Bill Hybels talks about this. He talks about Moses. And, and as Moses in Egypt, in, 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 um, in their slavery, he gets taken and is raised in the palace, has everything Egypt has to offer. And, and the scripture says that one day he went for a walk to see the condition of his people. He sees the Egyptian beating the Hebrew person. And something snaps in him. And he takes care of that by killing the Egyptian. And the next day he sees a Hebrew person beating a Hebrew person. And that same thing snaps. He says, we're under this oppression every day. Why are you brothers fighting against each other? And eventually he takes off and his heart is wrecked by the oppression and the beating down of God's people. Forty years later, he comes across the burning bush. And what does God say? put it into my own words. God says, I've heard the cries of the people. What wrecked you, Moses, also wrecks me, and I'm choosing you to go do something about it. What does God wreck your heart over about the condition of God's people? Many of us grew up watching the cartoon Popeye, and we know that, we know that cartoon, right? And Popeye's girlfriend was Olive Oil. Great name. And, and she was a real... Um, Traffic stopper. <laughs> That's Bill Hybel's words in that. But the truth is that whole story is based on one simple thing. If anything threatened olive oil, what was, what was Popeye's phrase? That's all I can stand, I can't stand it no more. And he pops open the spinach and, and puts that back and all of a sudden his body becomes anatomically improbable. All of this supernatural strength all right here in his biceps, and he deals with it. And folks, that's the same thing I'm seeing in Nehemiah here, and it unfolds over the next chapters. That's all I can stand. I can't stand it no more. His heart is absolutely broken because of the state of God's people. What 
does Nehemiah do? Day and night for days, he's praying. How do they accomplish this? We'll see that in the next week. Maybe what's most important is how does that broken heart change him? How does that broken heart actually change the people around him? Because one man whose heart was broken by God and set into action, that's where we're going to go these next eight weeks. What does God break your heart with? What is it that breaks God's heart and your heart? And together, what are we going to do? For me, here's one of the key things that breaks my heart. Christ is returning. The bride of Christ, us, the church, is not ready. Like Jeremiah's cry, come on, there is so much more. Christ is coming back to meet his bride. We are not ready. We are stuck in our own ways, the way we like it, our comfort zones, our safety and our fellowship, and we would fight to keep it that way. Even if the church dies around us. He asked me to prepare the bride. That's what drives our vision to know God, become like Jesus, change our world. When you're scratching your heads about decisions we make or changes, this is what's driving it. I'll never settle for okay. This is what messed up Israel for generations. They were so wrapped up in keeping their ways that they missed what God wanted. They kept missing what God was doing. I won't let us be found there. They were so wrapped up in getting their lives back, restoring their traditions, reestablishing their historic ways of following God. They spent a lifetime rebuilding it at all costs, so wrapped up in having it the way they wanted it, they missed Jesus. I refuse to let our church fall into that trap. That's me. That's my fire. That's what breaks my heart, and I know breaks the heart of God. And he asked me to do something about it. What is it in your life? What fire has God lit in you that burns in his heart too? The first building block in the book of Nehemiah is simply this. The willingness to let my heart be broken by God. That's where this whole book starts. God broke Nehemiah's heart. When God does this, there's often ridiculous change that happens. And we don't like that. Are we ready? Are we willing? I said at the beginning, the bottom line was God gives them his vision and his direction. Will they band together to make it happen? Will we? Are you ready? Join me for the next eight weeks. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, our God, may we understand Scripture the way you want us to understand Scripture. May we actually be able to open our eyes, open our minds, open our hands to see what you have for us rather than what we have for us. We all come to this with tons of preferences and likes and comfort zones and tradition and history of our own, and it's all different. God, may we be willing like Nehemiah to align our hearts with you, to allow you to break our hearts with what breaks your hearts and set us in a direction that pleases you. May we acknowledge the correction line and may our prayer be not to change things around us, but to change us. Renew us, revive us, replenish us, reconcile us. And may we run forward towards what you have for us. Will you journey with us, God? Will you enlighten us? Will you open our minds to see and understand? Change us as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great challenge to us this morning as we begin the series through Nehemiah. Are our hearts broken?
Do they long for what God's heart longs for? What a great challenge. I think of David, his prayer, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I hope that that's your heart this morning. And as we journey together through this, what a great privilege it is to be able to do that together. We're not alone. But as we look inward and as we surrender our hearts, as our hearts are broken for what breaks God's heart, we can journey together and we can become more like Jesus, more like the the church, the bride of Christ that he wants us to be. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word and the truth that is in it and how it speaks to us Uh, in so many different ways. Even this morning, uh, the passages that we looked at will be hitting us all differently. But God, we know that what you desire of us is hearts that are open uh, to hearing uh, from your Holy Spirit, uh, open to being changed, open to being uh, challenged and convicted. God, help us to be more and more like you. to be holy and faithful as you are holy and faithful. Bless your people as they go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.